And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another dejected post-Big Ten tournament episode of the Assembly Call, as today your Indiana Hoosiers fall to the Ohio State Buckeyes 79-75 to uh, in a game that ends Indiana's <laughs> very short run in the Big Ten tournament. It might end Indiana's hopes of an NCAA tournament bid, probably does end Indiana's hopes of an NCAA tournament bid as the Hoosiers fall to 17 and 15. And really, this was a game that in a lot of ways was a microcosm of this season since the start of January, where, you know, Indiana just really did not come to play uh, early, especially in the in the start of the second half. And Ohio State ends up building a 20 point lead. But with their backs firmly against the wall, desperation set in and Indiana actually went on a run and gave fans a little bit of hope there at the end, only to fall short as C.J. Jackson does it again, knocking down a couple of key free throws there when it was 77-75 to give Indiana or to give Ohio State a four-point advantage and ultimately seal the win. I'm your host, Jared Morris. I'm here with Ryan Phillips. We're going to break it all down for you on this very disappointed episode of the Assembly Call IU postgame show. And let's start the show the way we start every show, and that is with our Hoosier Proud banner moment. And for today's banner moment, I'm going to go to the 420 mark of the second half when Indiana – had been down 20. They cut it to 63-56 to 56 on a play where Deron Davis hit a layup. And that play was set up by a great Devontae Green steal on the other end. And it completed a 13-0 run uh, by the Hoosiers that included that Davis bucket, uh, two threes by Devontae Green, and also five points by Evan Fitzner. That run would eventually become a 26-9 run that brought Indiana within one possession at 72-69. to uh, The Hoosiers again would get even closer at 77-75 to after Devontae Green's 35-foot three-pointer. Uh, of course, Indiana wouldn't win, but after being down 20, it was nice to actually see you know, a last gasp of hope, at least, from Indiana. And I'm choosing this play for the banner moment, which, of course, is you know, kind of the moment in a game that suggests that brighter days ahead, that better days are ahead for Indiana, especially when you, when you have a loss like this. And I'm choosing that because this is the day when Devontae and Duran were so important for Indiana. You know, Devontae was Indiana's leading scorer with 26 points. Uh, he was actually plus three on the day. Duran was plus 12 in his 16 minutes on the court. And as those two guys have been all season long, you know, they have been they've been so important to this team. And as we look toward next year, the, the senior year for both of those guys, they're going to have to be leaders, you know, and, and the importance of that and the importance of having tough, experienced, older players was on full display today. Because as we're going to get into in the show, I think that's why Ohio State won this game, because they're you know, juniors and seniors in the backcourt really took it to our freshmen and young guys and just played tougher and played smarter. And, you know, it was because of Devontae and Duran that Indiana even had a chance today. So those guys have been huge all season long. They were huge today in Indiana even having a chance. And if what we saw from those two, especially Devontae, and especially what we've seen from Devontae over the last few games, if that is a sign of things to come uh, for him and for them as seniors then we at least know that as we look toward forward to next year, Indiana will have a couple of rocks uh, to kind of build on. Now, as we know, you know, projecting, especially for a guy like Devontae, uh, has been fraught with false starts. So there's a big if there. But certainly the performance that he put on today at least gives you confidence that as he heads into his senior year, he'll be ready uh, to make the most of it. All right. Well, today's Hoosier Proud Banner Moment brought to you, as always, by our friends at Hoosier Proud and Home Field. At homefieldapparel.com, you will find the comfiest and most unique licensed IU apparel that is available anywhere. And at hoosierproud.com, you'll find great state of Indiana themed apparel while sending 10% of your purchase to causes around Indiana, like the Hoosier Veterans Assistance Foundation. Both brands were started by an IU grad, and all Hoosier Proud and Homefield apparel is designed and printed out of Indianapolis. And with the Big Ten tournament in full swing, unfortunately not including Indiana anymore, uh, and the NCAA tournament looming, be sure to check out all of Homefield's officially licensed IU designs. And they've recently added several fantastic new items, and this is pretty exciting. They now have a tri-blend bison t-shirt. So we've told you about the hoodie, which has been so great for the winter. Now you can get the t-shirt so that you can wear your comfortable uh, tri-blend material with the awesome vintage IU Bison logo year round. Uh, in the words of Chat Mob or Megan. It's a big freaking deal. It is. And in addition to the Bison tee, there is also a hoodie version of the Script Indiana design and a sweatshirt version of the uh, vintage logo sneakers design. There's a van with a bed in it. Uh, that was get a brother get some coupons. Yes, you can get coupons. Use the promo code ACBIG10 during the Big Ten tournament to get 20% off your order on either site that's an extra five percent over the normal promo code that's promo code ac big 10 at hoosierproud.com and homefieldapparel.com 
Com. All right, well, it's time to move the ball, find the open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. That is Ryan Phillips. Ryan, your opening rant on yet another disappointing Indiana performance in the Big Ten tournament. Well, first I want to say I'm just glad we'll never have to see C.J. Jackson or Keyshawn Woods again. Good Lord. Those guys no just kidding. Hit, they hit daggers on Indiana and always have. And I mean, Woods only this year. But uh, C.J. Jackson's just been a dagger hitter for for. Uh, Ohio State against Indiana for years, and he had a couple big timely threes today. He hit three of them, and I thought all of them changed momentum. Um, but for Indiana, I mean, this is just – it's interesting because the first 25 minutes reminded me of January and February, and the last 15 minutes-ish, I mean, you know, 13-ish minutes, reminded me of the last, you know, two weeks. And, and it just is staggering to me. And I know you guys get on me about start times and all that stuff. 1130 start time. I expected it to be sloppy. I expected it to be ugly. And it was, it was both for both ways. teams. I know. Did you not just hear me say it was both ways? And what I was going to say is Ohio State weathered it better than Indiana did. Okay. They relied on their veterans. They relied on Woods and Jackson. And uh, and Caleb Wesson got going because of that. And Indiana did not have their veterans step up or their okay your star players step up and when you're fighting something like that when you're it's an unusual start time it's early you're maybe not as loose as you normally are guys have to step up and somebody has to step up Jawan morgan didn't step up romeo lankford didn't step up um you, you just didn't even rob Finnessy didn't play particularly well and, and these are guys you've been relying on and you need when you're in an awkward situation like that an uncomfortable situation it's just like playing on the road or something like that you need the guys you rely on to overcome that and weather that better. And, and Ohio State did and Indiana didn't. You're right. It happens to both teams. But you expect those games to be sloppy. You expect them to be, you know, to maybe not shoot well, to maybe not have your release point dialed in because you didn't warm up as long or, or whatever. But it's who deals with that better. And typically it favors the underdog uh, in, in, in a lot of situations, which is why I thought Indiana – really had a shot against Michigan State if they had gotten there tomorrow because they're going to play early again. And and the underdog typically handles that better because there's fewer expectations on them. Uh, that didn't happen today. I don't know who was – this was pretty much a pick em game, I thought. Um, and Indiana did not handle it well. And, and and the big glaring thing here is that Jawan Morgan had 12 points, four of eight from the field, only took eight shots. When you're down by that much, you need to be feeding that guy. He needs to be demanding the ball. He wasn't able to establish position on Caleb West, and he wasn't able to get anything going offensively on him. Uh, he had four of his points, four of his 12 points, came at the free throw line. Um, he was not aggressive offensively. Um, you know, he had three turnovers. Then you get Romeo Langford, only nine points, four of 12 from the field, one of five from three. Uh, one of those was, of course, the heave at the end. But he wasn't able to get into the post and mix anything up, and he wasn't able to get any calls. He didn't go to the free throw line once. I don't know if that's on the officials or on him, but he was not very aggressive. Um, you know, and that that's the story of the game to me right there is that is that those two guys didn't get going. Uh, Ohio State got balanced scoring from their stars. They got 13 and 17 from the Wesson brothers. They got 18 from Woods. They got 17 from C.J. Jackson. Um, and, and they were able to, you know, look in a game where, uh, you know, Ohio State turned it over 16 times. Indiana turned it over 17 times. Again, early game going to be sloppy on both ways. And you got to you got to handle it better. And what they did was they were able to convert those turnovers into points where Indiana wasn't able to do that. And uh, yeah, I mean, that that to me was the story of the game was that the two biggest players on Indiana, two best players on Indiana. Indiana's two all Big Ten guys did not step up and rise to the occasion, and they really needed to in this situation. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, you are right. You make a good point. You know, it's, it's the same early start time for both teams, but the more mature team handled it better. And, and I, you know, and that's typically the case. I mean, you know, it, it, it's typically the case that the team that handles it better will win. And uh, Indiana, yeah, they made that last gas comeback. But if they did, we'd be saying, man, they they made the comeback, but geez, they did not handle this well. I mean, that that would be the the story of it, I think. Um, yeah. And, and Ohio State, it looked got a little burned out at the end and looked a little tired and gave Indiana some open shots. And, you know, some ball luck went Indiana's way as well as things were just kind of falling uh, that weren't falling earlier. Yeah. And Indiana had one guy go supernova and Devontae Green, <laughs> you know, pretty much single handedly put the team on his back and really, you know, I think made the final score look a lot better than what the overall performance was because, you know, oh, when this you. game without, without Devontae Green, that's a 30 point. Loss. Yeah. And, and look, you know, obviously, you know, Indiana gets it back within one possession. So anything could happen at that time. But, you know, this game was lost early. 
you know, this game was lost in all of those little sequences early in the game when Ohio State outscored Indiana by two or three points, you know, built their 10, 11 point lead. And then they went on that big, you know, after it was 49, 41. And we'll talk about that moment here uh, in a little while. But, you know, they they push it out to 20. And, you know, to me, what I what I saw today, Ryan, was an Indiana team that did not have the desperation that they've had for the last three or four games. I saw a team that was not quick to 50-50 balls, that was not quick to rebounds. And in fact, there were even some balls that were like 75-25 balls that we should have gotten that Ohio State somehow ended up with. And this was a game, I thought, you know, you hear the adage, you need to get old and stay old in college basketball. And I thought that this was a game that Ohio State won because they're older and more mature than Indiana. Because their guards, C.J. Jackson, Keyshawn Woods, Andre Wesson, played a much more mature game, all juniors and seniors, than our guys. You know, Rob Finnessy was a non-factor. I talked about on Banner Morning today how it seemed unfathomable for Rob Finnessy to be a non-factor after how he's played. He was a non-factor. Justin Smith, a total non-factor. You know, and Romeo Langford, you know, had that little burst at the end, but really just wasn't able to get going offensively. And so credit to Ohio State. Credit to them for having a better game plan, and we'll get into the coaching because I think, you know, I think Archie Miller was out coached today. I thought Chris Holtman, you know, he understands how to beat this Indiana team and did it again, but I really think you saw the impact of physical and emotional maturity, especially in backcourt guys today, and I tip my cap to the Ohio State players because they came ready to win a basketball game. And outside of Devontae Green, and, and I'll give some props to Al Durham too, who I thought played with a lot of toughness and tried, but you know, when uh, you rely on I freshmen, Al- sometimes sometimes you get these performances from freshmen, and that's what happened to Indiana today, at least in, way, in the case of Rob and Romeo. By the way, I think Al spoke for every Indiana fan when he screamed and won after that. God. that When's I, he going to get some calls? I, I mean, don't seriously. Know. And like, Lankford didn't get any either. Lankford, I mean, Lankford, he, I, and I know we're hard on him for 4 of 12 today, but he, he was getting bumped. Yeah, around. but Al didn't shy away from contact. I that's agree. what I mean. Like, no, he should get true. those calls. I, I agree. I, I thought he and Lankford did not get the call today i thought finnessy had a couple drives where he got bumped clearly and affected the drive and the finish um i thought deron davis was getting hammered all day i thought Jawan morgan was now they were letting a lot of contact go both ways they were from the start of the game they were starting and let's not jump on that but you know when a guy has a clear lane to a layup and he's driving in and you and you bump him or slap him or whatever that's a clear foul call and i thought indiana i thought the balance of those went against indiana now there was a lot of rebound contact there was a lot of perimeter contact all that stuff that they allowed to go all day both ways uh but i thought there were some clear uh issues when indiana would miss a shot because of contact and when you miss a shot because of contact you probably should get the foul you should be going to the free throw line uh that should really be the baseline i get it if there's contact two guys jumping up in the air or whatever but when you miss the shot because of it um or it you know you barely make the shot as that as that al drive was because there's so much contact you got to get that call again doesn't change the outcome of the game i'm just saying it's another you know pelt on the wall for for horrible big 10 officiating and and uh you know i, I just thought it was a rough a rough game for everybody involved in that in that sense it was you know let's talk real quick before we get out of the segment you know, we wondered how Ohio State would play Indiana, you know, after the way that they played us in that first game where they really packed the paint, you know, dared certain guys to shoot like Justin Smith. And they played very similarly in the first half. And I thought our problem in the first half is we just played right into their hands. Half of our field goal attempts in the first half were three pointers. We yep. were four of 15, I believe. And Devontae was three of four. No, he was three of five. And only one of those is really a shot that I questioned. But, you know, Juwan was yeah, over too quick. Yeah, Juwan was over two. One of them, he's just like fading off balance at the top of the key. And look, I get it. You want to take some of those because some of them were open shots. But we also just settled. We didn't force the issue. And this was another game. You know, when Indiana was losing games in January and February, we would allow defenses to force us into the shots they wanted us to take. And you again, allow this the com- opponent to dictate what you're yeah, going to this, do. This, yeah. This, yeah it, you know, and it comes back to the maturity of the game. You know, they, they executed their game plan much better. And I, we didn't have any counters really in the first half to try and do anything else. And, and we certainly didn't have any early in the second half when the game, you know, was really lost, I thought. So, you know, credit to Chris Holtman. I mean, he basically said, look, we're going to do it again. We're going to prove that they've, you know, really changed something up since then. And we haven't because a lot of the same things that happened in the first game happened today. So in a lot of ways, this is a tough matchup for Indiana, but it's also disappointing that, you know, given some of the changes we've seen from this team over the last four games, that they didn't have some different answers today because it was very much in the first half 
a lot of what we saw the first game against these two teams. And that's that's disappointing. And I, I would have, you know, and again, you know, part of that is just because guys didn't step up and execute well. But I also just thought they had a better plan than we did and executed it better. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that they came in basically daring Indiana to shoot. And if you look at the numbers, that was the right way to do it. And without Devontae Green, Indiana was – uh, three of 17 from three, which is the exact, those are the exact kind of numbers they were shooting in that losing streak. And, and, uh, you take out those, you know, at one point they had more turnovers than field goals they had, you know, and, and so basically, you know, they shot 43% from the field today. And again, eight or, you know, eight of 10 were three pointers by Devonte green that went in a couple of which were just ridiculous. Cause you said, <laughs> you said he went supernova. And so you're looking at a shooting percentage without Devonte greens in the low thirties, maybe even high. Let's just stop using the phrase without Devonte green. Cause it's terrifying to try and think about it this really game is. without Devonte I mean, green. You know, it's and, a 30 and, and point by the loss. Way, and by the way, we've been as hard as anyone on Devonte green, but we've also said the last couple of weeks, that guy has changed the way he's playing. He's bought in. He's part of the team concept. He made his mistakes today. He had four turnovers. He had one that really killed. I think Some terrible thought, turnovers too. He had one where he had that that pass that was intercepted. I don't know who intercepted. It might have been Wesson. When it was sixty three fifty six, it was right yeah. after the banner moment, actually, which is and, I guess and fitting. We, you know, Indiana was in the middle of that hard, you know, tough run, and and just had all the momentum in the world. And he threw like a long pass that got intercepted, and uh, I don't even think it turned into a. Uh, it might have turned into a basket eventually, but it didn't lead directly to a basket. But it wound up getting them a basket, and that that really I thought killed the momentum. Uh, but again, there wouldn't have been any momentum if it wasn't for Devontae Green. And then he continued, you know, instead of shrugging his shoulders after that, he continued to shoot. And here's the thing about Devontae Green. He can shoot like that. When he sets his feet and when he steps into a shot, uh, they're going in. It, the question for me with him has always been off the dribble. You know, sometimes he doesn't set his feet. He, t- he just kind of flings the ball up there. And sometimes he shoots it too quick when he gets it and he rushes it. But when he has his feet set and he's, ang- he's you know, aiming at the hoop and, and in rhythm, he can hit those, and, he, and he's proven that time and again. Um, and he's proven that he can go off for something like 26 points. I know this is a career high, but he's proven that he can go nuclear. He did it against Ohio State last year. Um, the problem is, is that the rest of the team didn't step up around him. I thought Evan Fitzner deserves some credit because, again, another guy who sort of disappeared and hadn't been well. I thought he played well even before he played he well today. But even, even without the threes, he played well. He, he bodied yeah. up guys. He grabbed a couple of rebounds. He had a couple of steals. Um, I, I thought that that charge call late, I know a lot of people are arguing with me about that. I thought Wesson was still moving towards him. I did not think that was a charge. I thought that was a no call, not a, not a block. I thought it was a no call because he gave the ball up. Um, but I think, and also Wesson, a 300 pounder went down like a sack of potatoes. Like, you know, he weighed four pounds, but anyway, uh, I didn't have as big a problem with that. Call. I, look, I, I get why they called it because Fitzner was coming in hard, maybe a little out of control, but Wesson, I thought was still sliding towards him at the time. But if you're Fitzner, you have to be smarter than that too. And no, you're not going to drive straight to the hoop without any, uh, you know, without any resistance. So I get it. I thought it should have been a no call, but, um, Again, credit to him, credit to Deron Davis. Even Deron Davis had four turnovers, but a lot of those were offensive. A couple of those were offensive fouls. A couple of them were screening fouls. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I look, it, there were guys who did play well and who stepped up, and I think that Deron Davis, certainly when he was in the game, we were, Indiana was much better, and he was on the floor for most of the big run. Uh, and, and I thought that they really should have fed him the ball early. And, and I think if they move on to the next level, I know Justin Smith has been pretty good lately. He had a tough day today. Okay, this is a game where if you had asked me who's the guy who's going to struggle with the early game the most, I would have said Justin Smith easily Uh, just because I I don't don't know. It's just the way he he tends to glide through games in tough situations. Uh, But I would say that that if if this team's going to the NIT, which I assume is going to happen, I'd start to Ron Davis and I would feed him early. And because Juwan Morgan hasn't really been getting established in the post uh, on a regular basis, he did on senior night the other night, but he hasn't really been doing that over the last couple of weeks. And I, I would kind of think that Deron Davis having his back to the basket is Indiana's best offense right now. Yeah. All right. Coming up as we continue our breakdown of Indiana's loss to Ohio State, I'll point out today's meaningful moment that you might have missed. And then we will go inside the numbers to highlight the most important statistical notes from the game. I'm guessing turnovers will come up a lot. You're listening to the Assembly Call. Stick with us.
You're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with Ryan Phillips, and we are picking up the pieces from yet another Big Ten tournament loss for Indiana. A soul crushing Big Ten tournament loss, as if there are any other kinds of Big Ten tournament losses for this or Big program. Ten tournament games. Quite yeah, frankly. just appearances. God. By the way, I'm done with you feeling good about the Big Ten tournament. <laughs> you said Dude, that. we should all be done with feeling good about it. I don't. How I, how on earth did any of us let ourselves t- like we talked ourselves into it because of four straight good games, and that is shame on all of us who thought something good in the Big Ten tournament was going to happen. Respect the curse or whatever dark cloud the Big Ten tournament has over us. And remind me of this next year. If I talk myself into hope before the Big Ten tournament, tell me to shut up and let's wait and see it before we actually believe it. Okay? Okay. That's how I feel about it. Well, I Very, definitely will be then. Okay, yes. Bring this back. Bring this audio drop back and just play it for me if I try and talk myself into hope. There okay. is no, there is no hope moron. in the Big Ten tournament. I can do that. That's fine. Whatever. Um, okay, it's time. <laughs> I got some frustration to get out, man. God dang, that game is frustrating. Hey, you know what's great That's, about that? You have a show where you're allowed to talk. So I know. Go ahead. Let it I all just, out, man. Man, I, I thought we were going to play better. I just, I did. I'm, I'm really disappointed by how we came out. And this, this kind of leads me into the meaningful moment. There's, there's a lot of them that we could get to. You know, I do want to mention when it was 49 to 41. And, you know, we had made that nice little play. Juwan slipped that ball screen. Romeo made the great pass to him. Juwan gets fouled. You know, it's the 12.54 mark. And it felt like we were starting to build a little bit of momentum in the second half. And then, you know, we go down and Rob turns it over. No, no, Rob passed it to Juwan. So we get the ball back. It's 49-41. Now we have the ball. And it feels like, okay, some momentum. Rob throws it to Juwan, and Juwan just, like, fumbles the ball away. Yeah. I mean, it was a terrible turnover. It turns into a layup for Ohio State the other way, 51-41. We don't get a long rebound on the next possession. Uh, Wesson ends up scoring 53-41. I wrote in my notes, ball game, because I felt like that was the ball game because it felt like if we're going to make a run, we need to make it right now. They ended up going on a 14-2 run after that play to get it to 63-43. to Now, we all know what happened. Indiana made a big run back. But my God, when you have to come back from 20 points, everything has to go perfectly. A couple things didn't, and you know, and we lose the game. And, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Ryan, you know, I think a lot of people will remember that moment. The moment that really sticks out to me that I thought was really indicative of why Indiana lost this game, very first possession of the second half. You know, you haven't played well. You're down seven. Really nice strip by Juwan on Wesson. There's a loose ball on the ground that is just rolling up the middle of the lane. And there is no one in the picture for Ohio State. Al Durham is right there. And he just, like, jumped over the ball. He just whiffed on getting the loose ball. Ohio State ends up tying it up. It's a jump ball. Ohio State ends up scoring on that play. And I just thought that set the tone for the first eight minutes of the half. It was a continuation of the first half where every loose ball, they got it. We didn't. We have a chance to help ourselves out. And I mean, there wasn't even anybody there. And that was just part of this is when there was a tough play to be made for the first 28 minutes of the game, Ohio State was the team that was making them. And we just dug ourselves too much of a hole. So it's great that Indiana came back. I'm glad that we had that last gasp of excitement. But it's those plays that lost Indiana this game. Because over you know over a 40-minute game, you're going to make some shots. They're going to make some shots, all that stuff, between two evenly matched teams. Loose balls, hustle plays, toughness plays, that's what's going to determine it. And Ohio State was just more mature, played harder, played tougher than Indiana did today. And that's why there's really no surprise why they won the game. Yeah, I wouldn't so. be surprised if Ohio State beats, beats Michigan State tomorrow either if they play like this, uh, just from an aggressiveness standpoint and things like that. And, and Michigan State, again, you play that early game, it tends to favor the underdog to play in a, a sloppy rock fight like that. And let, let's be real about Ohio State. Ohio State didn't play well for the first five minutes either. Neither team did. It was ugly. They made a couple more shots, but it was it was an ugly, ugly fight for the first I'd say 10 minutes, really. And then Ohio State got a couple points, you know, before the half and was able to extend that to to seven before the half. But they didn't play particularly well. They, I agree with you on the game plan. They had the right game plan defensively, force IU to shoot the ball. And IU was more than happy to oblige, which is is the real problem, I think, uh, with yeah. that. But at the same time, you know, Ohio State didn't play particularly well. And then they had that run where they really got it going in the second half to extend it to about 20. That was really the only time I was thinking, Ohio State looks like a really good team right now. 
The rest of the game, I just thought Ohio State was doing what Indiana was. They just had a couple of threes go down, and, and that was really what extended it and got Wesson And going. they got some extra possessions. They did. <laughs> and, and, and you know, the turnovers from Indiana were giving them, why, you know, opportunities. Um, but I didn't think Ohio State necessarily played that great. It wasn't like Indiana had something to overcome. Uh, I just thought that. Yeah, Ohio except for State, themselves. I just think That's Ohio State. I just think Ohio State didn't play as badly as Indiana did. Um, but then you get that late run, and it what's so disappointing is this has ended as a twenty point loss. You throw your arms up in the air and say, "Wow, there it is again." But then you have that run at the end, and you're just like, "Oh God, they could have done this all game." I mean, because of the way they were attacking, how loose they were playing, uh, they finally looked warmed up and into it. I mean, they they looked stiff when they came out for the game. You saw, I, I think it was Rob Finnessy took a three that was like three feet off. I mean, it was not even in the right zip code. Um, Juwan Morgan airball the three, you know, and it, it's just that kind it's of almost like when we toss the game plan out the window and just play desperate, things flowed a lot better. I mean, you know? I, you know, I don't even know if it's that because they were clearly running and screening and doing all that. They just finally, it was almost like they were playing under no pressure because they were down by so much. And they just, it was, there was a looseness and a flow to the game because they were yeah. like, well, we got nothing to lose. Uh, and it's almost like that's how they've played the last four games. Uh, before this too is just there's just a looseness and a flow to the game where they're not putting pressure on themselves and i i don't know what it is i don't know what the what the difference is what the result uh, or, or what caused that result um but they certainly played the way they're capable of in the last couple minutes everybody was getting involved it wasn't just i mean i know Devonte was hitting those big threes but Quite frankly, he'd been doing that all game. It wasn't like it was just him bringing them back. It was other guys were involved. Guys were playing hard. They were getting and one uh, opportunities, um, you know, not necessarily called, but you saw, you know, uh, Durham play through contact and and guys like that attack other guys attacking. So um, and I also thought it was interesting that Rob Finnessy was off the floor for most of that. Um, and, and it was Devonte Green show. And, you know, Rob, again, just, Rob just didn't have it from the he start. Just did not have he, it was today. Ten, he was tentative again. Uh, and you know, been, if you're looking at the, the main reason this team won those last four games, it was Rob Finnessy getting back to where he had been. And you look and at him, Justin Smith too, the right, two of those and just, guys, obviously. And, and Justin stepping up and, and, uh, and Devante even stepping up in some cases. But if you look at the one reason it's been yeah. Rob Finnessy, his two way play. And you look at Rob today, one of six, one rebound, one assist, three turnovers, and two points on the day. Man, and he missed he, he missed the front end of a one and one badly. I mean, it's he played like a freshman today. He did, and the moment was too big for him. And yeah. and, and he couldn't overcome the you know how difficult it is to play this early or whatever. I mean, he just could not. It was out the window, and, and Devontae Green, you know, blew past him. And here's the thing. Moving forward for Indiana, if we're going to talk about the NIT, which, by the way, if Indiana has a chance to play in the NIT, they should absolutely play in the NIT. The, it, You're darn right. We haven't yeah, made a tournament in two years. I mean, any of this, you know, well, we don't want to accept a home game or, or you know, whatever. But that's crap. That is chicken crap. It, yes, it, it is. Absolutely. It is. You that is play arrogant NIT, chicken crap. And you, by the way, you play in the NIT and you try and win the dang thing. You don't just do a token one game. You try and win the dang thing and build momentum towards next year. And if anybody's uh, not invested in winning the dang thing, you don't play them. Yeah, and and here's the thing with Ro uh, a guy like Romeo Langford, we've seen guys who are going to be one and done sit out of uh, you know the NIT and opt out of it, and I understand why. It absolutely makes sense. Uh, I'm a guy sitting over here who thinks Zion Williamson should have sat out for the rest of the year. I know he's that not that kind of kid, but after a knee injury, he should have sat out the rest of the year. He's going to play tonight. Um, but Romeo, I would understand if he didn't play in the NIT because I mean it's really not what his goal was. But after today, I would really encourage him to play and try and dominate the NIT because at least boo hoo then. if that's not what your goal is. I mean, I don't know. I, I think you're with a team. You committed to play. I agree. Like, let's play. Not if you're hurt. Fine. Don't play. You don't right. rush back. But come on. I would I would uh, I if I was if I was and by the guy, way, there's been no even whisper that that would no, be the case. We have no, no idea about all. that. So not just to be just, clear. I'm, yeah. And, and, and there's no indication that Romeo has checked out on the team or anything like that. He's been a team player. He's been very involved. Everybody's raved about him as a teammate. Uh, so I don't want to put that out there as far as like we're hearing stuff. I'm just saying that I'd understand sitting out, but I think after his performance today, he should he should his his investment should be in going and playing in that tournament and trying to dominate it and be the MVP of it. Uh, I think that should be his focus uh, yep. because he showed a lot of weakness today 
and and uh, I think that that he really needs to to sort of change that, uh, change gears on that uh, moving forward if he wants to be a lottery pick. Yep. All right. Well, since this is a post game show on a Thursday, today's meaningful moment that you might have missed brought to you by Comfort Option. And if you live in Indy or Bloomington, you need to go to comfortoption.com right now to set up your in home mattress store service. There's a van with a bed in it. Seriously, they bring the mattress store to your house. It is incredible. And if you live outside the Indy or Bloomington area, you can order the Alpha mattress and have it shipped anywhere in the U.S. Plus, all of it is covered by Comfort Options 3060 guarantee. And this is the real important part for this ad read. For a limited time, you can use the promo code assembly to get $100 off your mattress, which is more than what they normally do. Uh, And they're doing it kind of special since we're doing our donation drive right now as a way to support the show because Comfort Option is also going to send another $100 to us. So it's a great way to get an amazing mattress for an even better price and to support the assembly call as well. Again, comfortoption.com, promo code assembly for $100 off your comfortable new mattress. All right, Ryan, let's go inside the numbers, and we don't need to linger on this too much because who cares about numbers when you lose and you feel like your bubble is popped. But the big numbers that are going to jump out, obviously, 17 turnovers for Indiana. Such a huge part of Indiana's offensive resurgence has been – you know, doing a better job, taking care of the ball. Uh, And Indiana wasn't able to compensate with enough offensive rebounds, only getting nine offensive rebounds. And and that's been the way that Indiana has compensated for poor shooting has been offensive rebounds and turnovers. And outside of Devontae, this is a very poor shooting day for Indiana. um, And they weren't able to do that. I'll tell you the other number that really made a big difference. Ohio State was up by seven at halftime. They had a seven point advantage in fast break points. And the big reason for that, you know, the turnovers were pretty even. I think Indiana had nine at halftime. Ohio State had eight, but it was the types of turnovers. It was the return of the live ball turnover on just the terrible pass. I mean, Indiana has been a pretty bad passing team all year, but it was really bad today. You know, Deron Davis has basically handed one to Wesson. Devontae Green, for all the good plays that he made, you know, when it was 63 to 56, he just he tried to kind of make a baseball pass and just right to Ohio State. I mean, it was, you know, some of the passes Indiana was making were better than passes Indiana quarterbacks make at times, um, you know, to Ohio State players because it was just right there. Um, And so that was the big difference, you know, as Indiana's turnovers led directly to points for Ohio State. And while Indiana actually did a pretty nice job, I mean, Indiana had nine steals. They forced some turnovers of their own. Uh, Ohio State had 16 turnovers. Indiana wasn't quite as good until very late there at the end of turning those into points. And so that was a big advantage for Ohio state, the entire game. Um, I will say a really, a really surprising stat here is that Indiana actually had 18 assists on 27 makes. I I was shocked by that. I I just didn't think the ball moved well enough for long enough in the game for them to rack up that many assists, but they did. And Devontae had four assists. Langford had five. Durham had three. Uh, Those guys were moving the ball and maybe more than I would have given them credit for looking, you know, just watching the game. Yeah. Yeah, it just it took him too long to get, you know, and look, part of the problem is, as we talked about, you know, Juwan really struggled to get himself going offensively. Justin Smith was not in it offensively. Rob struggled, you know, and to Archie's credit, I mean, he sat those guys in the second half. You know, he didn't stick with them too long. And he said, OK, you know, Romeo, Al, Devante, you know, Deron, they're, Evan Fitzner, they're going to do the things that I that we need to do against this defense. And he played those guys. So, you know, I give Archie some credit for those decisions for you know, playing Duran in the second half when he had three fouls, and I know he picked up the fourth foul, but at the time Indiana was down 11 and you were only functioning well when Duran was on the court. I give him credit for that. I think you have to roll the dice and be a little bold in that moment. He did. It didn't work out, but I think a decision like that, you know, you have to trust a process more than just the outcome of the decision. Um, and, in, you know, and, you know, so it didn't work out as well, but I thought Archie did some things in the second half to try to, you know, meet the desperation of the moment and his team eventually did it. But the problem again is you were down by seven in the first half because the other team had a better plan and executed. He also, he also too little too late. He also stuck with Fitzner a bit, which I think a lot of people would have been like, Oh no. And then Fitzner knocked down a couple threes was uh, really active on the glass was really, it was actually pretty good defensively considering who he was guarding. And, and, uh, you know, so I, I thought that was interesting. And he also knew, he needed to have Fitzner on the floor for his shooting ability uh, because he had to come back by, from so much. So uh, yeah. a couple of interesting decisions by him, a couple you know tweaks and everything. I mean, look, if this team just comes out and plays better on the floor, you know, and I, I guarantee you Archie isn't sitting there when they're launching three pointers in the first half and thinking, yeah, OK, this is fine. I mean, he, he knows what they do well and what they don't. And, you know, when your starting lineup goes one of 14 from three, 
uh that's not and, and the, then the one by the way was romeo in the opening it was the opening basket of the game for iu they went oh i mean your team's coming over every four minutes to talk so maybe like tell him not to do it like I, it's I mean, fine you, that he doesn't think that they're good shots but at some point like you got to change in the first well, half you can tell him as much as you want if they're not gonna listen i mean you know that's that's one <laughs> well, thing yeah. okay but he still gets held accountable for that you're right no i'm, I'm not okay i'm not abdicating responsibility on him i'm just saying i guarantee you he's not sitting over there thinking yeah things are going well yeah he, no you know and and people i i because i've seen some people being like hey what adjustments does archie miller make well he tried some things i don't think anybody was was you know they were just falling into the trap that ohio state was setting for them in the first half certainly um one thing i did think was really interesting is that the bench outscored the starters tonight uh or today and and Devonte green scored 26 while the st starters scored 32 uh that's we have four freshmen and sophomores starting, and this was a game for juniors and seniors. That's yeah, the thing. You had to play like a junior and a senior tonight to be in this game. And unfortunately, Juwan Morgan, our one senior for most of the game, didn't really play that no. way. You know, this was not a vintage performance from him. Not That's at all. We, the and, problem. And Indiana needed it and uh, didn't get it. So, yeah. Okay, let's move on. Let's go to segment three. All right, coming up on the assembly call, we continue our breakdown of Indiana's loss to Ohio State. I suppose we'll probably break down some more individual performances. We'll probably look big picture too, and maybe we'll just talk more about how much we hate the Big Ten tournament because screw the Big Ten tournament. That's next on the assembly call. Stick with us. You're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night at our website, assemblycall.com. And while you're there, make sure that you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 6,000 of your fellow IU fans are subscribed. You'll get our post game analysis emails, and of course, into the off season, which may be here sooner than we all want. Uh, you'll get our six banner Sunday news roundups as well. I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with Ryan Phillips. We're breaking down Indiana's 79. It's a 75 loss to Ohio State in the Big Ten tournament. Um, all right, Ryan, you know, what else that we haven't talked about stands out to you? Because I think, you know, there's only so much that we can say about what happened to Justin Smith and Rob Finnessy today. Two guys that have been huge. You know, look, when I, I did my banner morning and I talked about three reasons why this game would be different than Ohio State. All right. One reason was, you know, Caleb Wesson coming back. With him coming back after missing three games, would he be a little bit rusty? Would he be a little out of rhythm and pick up early fouls? We didn't see that. I thought maybe we would. We didn't see it. I also think Indiana didn't force the issue enough by pounding it inside. You know, I like, you know, that Archie got Deron Davis into the game a little bit earlier, you know, and, and Indiana's offense went pretty well in the first half when he was out there, but he picked up the two fouls and only played six minutes. But, you know, credit to Caleb Wesson. He wasn't especially efficient on offense, but he is the sun around which everything Ohio State does orbits, and he did a really nice job. He recognized the double teams. He passed out of it well. He played much better. He was more ready for the moment than we were, so that was wrong. The other two reasons I thought this game would be different is that Justin Smith and Rob Finnessy were basically no-shows in that game. I mean, Justin had eight points. Rob had, you know, five. They didn't play well, and I thought with how they had played, they would be much more ready for this game. And they were actually worse in this game than they were in the first game against Ohio State. They combined for two points and just absolutely weren't there. So all of the optimism that I had and the reason why I thought that we were going to win this game, based on evidence that we had seen, went out the window because those things didn't happen. So, well, you know, optimism. You, you tell, you tell, yeah, I mean, you tell me that, and I would have said that Ohio State would win like they did. So, you know, optimism I, of any kind needs to uh, go out the window when we're talking about the Big Ten tournament, Jared. I think we've all learned that lesson. Well, uh, I, you know, right now it may need to, you know, go out the window when we're playing Ohio State until we adjust and play a little better against them. You know, well, as, as I said in my opening, thank God CJ Jackson and uh, Keyshawn Woods will not be back uh, unless they somehow find a sixth year of eligible, a fifth or sixth year of eligibility or whatever. But um, no, I look, I mean, we can go round and round on this all we want. The, the story of the game is the starters didn't play well. Uh, Morgan and Langford, I mean, we, we can talk about Smith and Finnessy all we want, but Morgan and Langford, <clears throat> they're played, the guys. 
those uh, Finnessy and Smith played a combined 33 minutes. Langford played 36 and Morgan played 29. So those guys, yeah, you need them, but they weren't the problem on the court because they weren't on the court because Archie took them out because they weren't playing well. Uh, the guys that needed good point up are the guys that were irreplaceable, which is Romeo Langford cannot be replaced. Juwan Morgan cannot be replaced. Um, you know, Deron Davis can come in for Justin Smith. Evan Fisner can come in for Justin Smith and give you some good minutes. Devontae Green stepped up in Rob Finnessy's place. Um, but if Morgan and Langford play even to half of their capability, Indiana wins this game. And we're talking about, well, let's hope the Justin Smith and Rob Finnessy bounce back. Um, and the problem is Juwan and Romeo played just like they did in the first game against Ohio yeah, State. It, and it, that it, I overlooked it, that because I expected more out of them in this, in and this I, game. And I think Romeo needs to start, if he can't get to his right, which we all know is exactly what he wants to do, is get to his right. If he can't get to his right, he needs to do what he did against Michigan State and start backing guys down and start using his post moves and using his ability around the basket. And I and, saw and his mid range jumper. I mean, he made saw, another one of those today. And I saw him do that a little bit today, uh, but not enough because nobody on let's face it, nobody on Ohio State can guard him. It, it, it it's just there's not anybody. All they were doing was just overplaying his right, forcing him left. And when they do that, he would pass. He's a team player. He realizes, hey, this isn't my best situation. Let me move the ball along and I'll I'll reload and find another spot to pick my spot. But he needs to take some ownership, especially when the team is struggling like it did in the first half. He and Morgan both needed to take over and they didn't. And and they abdicated that responsibility. And that's we've touched on that all year that that's been an issue, that when this team goes bad, you need your leaders to step up and make plays. And they haven't, and they didn't. And, and when they lost the 12 out of 13, they needed that from those guys. Every game, they needed that from those guys and weren't getting it. You know, the numbers in the end might look nice in some of those games, but if you actually watch the game flow, uh, those guys didn't step up when the team needed to staunch momentum. And it happened again today. When Ohio State went on its big run, those guys didn't do anything. And, and didn't do anything to stop it. And that's a problem. And, and, and it needs to be something that changes. I realize Langford's a freshman. Uh, he's never going to be perfect. That's just the, the nature of being a freshman, even when you're a star. So few of these guys are you know, a complete player yet. And Romeo certainly isn't. He's a great player, and I've loved watching him in Indiana. Uh, but he's just not. That's one area of his game that he needs to step up is, is feel the momentum of the game, feel where the game is, and say, okay, no matter what happens here, I'm getting, I'm either getting fouled or the ball's going in the hoop. One of two things will happen. Yeah. And, and, you know, basically being like point to a spot on the floor and dare them to defend you. I'm getting there. I'm going to put the ball up and you're going to foul me or I'm going to score. Uh, Morgan needs to be able to do that too on the post. He needs to be able to catch the ball on the post and say, this ball's going in or I'm going to the free throw line. And, and it, th that's the way you staunch momentum is attacking, making the other team foul you or putting the ball in the hoop. One of two ways. And sometimes you combine them both for a three-point play. That's how you stop a team's momentum. And then you go back and you defend on the other end. And um, the one, you know, the one area I could complain about a little with Devontae Green is that he didn't close out to CJ Jackson fast enough a few times today and got burned. And and yeah. I feel I feel like things are going so badly in the paint that he was trying to overcompensate and you cannot leave a shooter like that, especially a guy who, even if he's not a great shooter, has killed Indiana. He just kills Indiana every time. Yeah. Um, so, again, I, I just think that you, we can talk about Smith and Fantasy as much as we want. And, look, moving forward, they need Smith and Fantasy to play well. There's no question about that. But today, I'm looking at Langford, I'm looking at Morgan, and I'm looking at their stat lines and thinking, where were they when yeah. the team needed them? That's fair. You know, and One thing I've wondered is why Romeo doesn't take – a few more of those mid-range twos. Like, I know it's not a good shot for a lot of guys, but it seems to be a shot he can get, and I just pulled up at Synergy. You know, between 17 feet and the three-point line, he averages one point per possession on those shots. He's in the 90th percentile. And you saw him take that shot, you know, from near the top of the key today. He can get that shot. We saw it against Maryland. We saw it against Penn State. You know, we saw it tonight. That's, as you kind of look in hindsight, you know, I kind of wish that he looked for that shot a little bit more because at least for him, with the way teams are playing him, you know, if they're going to overplay him going right, do that little crossover dribble to the left and get that shot. I feel like he could, I feel like he could get that uh, more often than he was, uh, than he was taking it. Oh, man. God, just such a disappointing loss for the Hoosiers. So, it's so let me ask you this. I it is. That. It's just a huge missed opportunity because Ohio State did not play particularly well they had stretches where they played well 
But that first half, the game was there for the taking. And, and Ohio State got off to just as slow a start as Indiana. You watch that. They, they got a couple more shots to fall. But in general, they were off too. And, and you expect, again, you expect that with the start time. Both teams were just off. And eventually, Ohio State rounded into form faster and started making some shots. And then in the second half, they had that big run that buried Indiana. So let me ask you a question here, and then we'll, we'll go on to the next segment. You know, as you move forward from this, because now what's happened with these last few games, and especially this one, and again, we're not heading into the offseason yet. We don't know what will happen. Indiana could somehow miraculously get in the NCAA tournament. They can make the NIT. There will be more games almost surely. But you look at this now, and Devontae Green, as he did last year, you know, kind of ends the season on a high note. Now, it wasn't right at the end of the, you know, toward the end of the season like this, and it wasn't as good as this. But, you know, one of the big questions in the offseason is going to be, what do you expect from him? And I think when you see games like today and what he's done the last few games, it does give you hope that as a senior, he's ready to kind of be mature and take a leadership role. Because that's what he did today. Like this team needed a leader today and he just decided, I'm going to do it. Like someone needs to be confident, step up and take shots. I'm going to do it. And he's clearly got that in him. You know, sometimes it's to his detriment. Today, it was exactly what Indiana needed. And so I'm not asking you for an answer because we know, again, like I said earlier, that trying to project forward for Devontae Green is fraught with so much uncertainty and so many false starts. But if you're looking for something to be hopeful about moving forward from this game, you know, again, you know the importance of seniors and upperclassmen and seeing him do this today gives you some hope that maybe the light switch has come on for real. Maybe. I'm not saying I'm predicting it, but I am saying that that's going to be a pretty popular topic of offseason conversation. I can already tell. Well, look, Devontae has to be a leader. He and Duran. He does. To, and, and, and by the way, he and Duran are going to be the seniors, and Duran needs to, you know, keep him in line when he wants to sort of do those things. And, and I trust Duran to do that. If, if Duran and Devontae are both going to be back, I trust Duran to be a guy who kind of smacks everybody around and keeps them, metaphorically, and keeps them, you know, focused. Uh, and, and he's got to do that with Devontae as much as anybody. And he's got to keep him in line. And uh, that's going to be their responsibility a, a, as a duo and, and is to be, uh, you know, is to be the guys who set the tone for everybody else and and not get down on guys, but build them up and, and, and keep them in check, but build them up when they can. And uh, so obviously seeing Devontae sort of step up over the last four games and then today as well uh, really does bode well. But the question, the thing is, though, he can't get too high about it. He's got to realize how yeah. much work he still has left to do. Yeah. You know, uh, Roger in the chat says, quit saying Ohio State didn't play. Well, that's just who they are. They aren't good. They just wanted it more. And yeah, to a I mean, degree, they, Roger's right. I mean, right. I don't think they're. I don't think Ohio State's a great team. I just don't think they played well. And they, I, I mean, they, they they turned it over. They didn't shoot great in the first half. They actually could have been up more because they missed some open they, opportunities. Yeah, but but his last point, that's the point that we've been trying to make. They wanted it more. They were and they tougher. played better. They, they rounded into form faster. They were more mature. Yeah, I'm and they had saying, a better game plan to fall back on. I'm not even saying Ohio State. Playing, yeah, I'm not saying Ohio State's a should 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 be a five seed in the NCAA tournament or anything. I'm just saying that they didn't play particularly well in the beginning, and IU didn't play particularly well, and then Ohio State got up to speed faster. But this game was there for the taking in the first half because Ohio State did not get going. When Ohio State gets rolling and is hitting shots and Wesson's dominating, they're not a bad team. I mean, they're a pretty good team. They're, they're an NCAA tournament team, and they probably got into the NCAA tournament by winning today. Um, I, of course, it'll depend how they play against Michigan State and then how some other bubble teams fit, but they probably earned their way into the NCAA tournament today. Because now the committee, especially with recency bias in play, will look at those three games they lost where they were basically non-competitive, two of them, and say, okay, Wesson wasn't here. Look at the impact he made today. Exactly. And that's the chance I Indiana had if they would have won today. I, I thought today was definitely an elimination game. I, I thought that the, the losing team was out. I know some people are saying, well, Indiana could still get in. I, and I don't think that's happening. I don't think it really I just said that like two minutes ago, but I didn't mean it for real because I yeah, don't think we will. I mean, I'm seeing people put tweet about it, like Indiana's not out. I, I think we need to come to reality that Indiana's probably out. And, and again, just like in this game, Indiana dug itself too big a hole to climb out of. No matter how well the last two weeks went, when you lose 12 to 13, and there are games there that were there for the taking. Yeah. I mean, there were three or four games in that stretch that could have gone either way, and Indiana didn't close out as well as they needed to or didn't start as well as they needed to or gave up a, a run in the second half that they just two points here, two points there, changed the outcome of the game. Indiana dug itself too big a hole. And, and if they don't get in, I realize they had a lot of great wins and they played really well and they're a different team right now. I mean, you know, today didn't show that, but they're a different team right now than they were during that losing streak. We all know that. Um, 
but quite frankly, you know, they, they don't deserve to be in given what they did over the, over January and February. No, the first 28 minutes of this game were absolutely a microcosm of the second half of the season for Indiana. And unfortunately it did not end well. All right. Coming up in our final segment, we're going to hand out our game ball. That'll be easy. Uh, We'll hit any other storylines that we haven't hit yet. And then we'll go to last call. Our final thoughts on another big 10 tournament disappointment for Indiana. That's next. Stick with us here on the assembly call. You're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I'm Jared Morris here with Ryan Phillips, wrapping up our breakdown of Indiana's loss to Ohio State, 79-75. It ends Indiana's stay in Chicago in the Big Ten Tournament. Probably ends Indiana's chances of making the NCAA Tournament. We'll await the official bracket unveiling on Sunday and then see what happens with the NIT unveiling after that because certainly with Indiana two games over 500 and the quality wins that they do have, you would expect the Hoosiers uh, to be a team that uh, at least is going to be able to be in the NIT. And probably get a home game. I mean, let's be honest. Probably. So we'll see uh, We'll see how that goes. But, Ryan, let's hand out our game balls, and I suppose this will just be a few more minutes of lauding Devontae Green for an imperfect uh, but certainly – essential and encouraging performance today. Uh, one of the best shooting performances in IU history as he goes 8 of 10 from downtown. Yeah, g- uh, g- credit to Devontae. He gets the game ball, obviously. I think hat tip to Evan Fitzner. I thought he played, who was probably the second best player on the court. Maybe D- Deron Davis too, but Deron only played 16 minutes because of foul trouble. Um, but Devontae, you know, 9 of 15 from the field, 8 of 10 from 3, uh, a rebound, 4 assists, 2 steals, 2 blocks. Uh, he did have the four turnovers, and a couple of those were pretty bad. But eight of eight of ten from three wipes away your turnovers. I'm sorry. And you know, at the end of the game, he was just unconscious. He was lining up from what thirty feet and knocking him in. I mean, and he had four assists. I mean, he was creating too. He yeah, wasn't just making certainly. shots. So. And and he finished at the rim at one point too. Uh, look, that that's the kind of performance. I mean, when you come into the season. I think we all expected Devontae Green to have performances like this occasionally to occasionally turn in a big scoring performance because we knew he's capable of it. We haven't seen it this year. He's been wildly inconsistent. We didn't expect him to be the most consistent player in the world, but we expected him to occasionally, you know, light up the scoreboard. He really hasn't done that much this year. He's done it a couple of times. Um, and we expected him to be Indiana's best three point shooter, probably. Um, Maybe he and Evan Fitzner were the two guys you expected to be able to knock down shots. And then Rob Finnessy certainly uh, in there as well. Uh, Hasn't done that and and, uh, hasn't done it consistently. But seeing it today uh, was encouraging and hopefully heading into next season. This is something he builds off of and doesn't rest on. Uh, I think that's that's really a a distinction that needs to be made is that, you know, that he builds off of this performance as opposed to just thinking, oh, I got it all figured out now. Uh, So. Devonte for next season, you know, a performance like this excites you because you put him in the mix with fantasy and hopefully Jerome Hunter and uh, some of the other guys that are going to be in the backcourt, uh, Armand Franklin, certainly uh, Al Durham, you put them all together. And if you can get one of those guys to go off every, you know, other game or so, you're going to be in a really good spot as a team, because I think those are, that's, there's a lot of solid players in that mix who can, who can do some things for you. Uh, breaking news here, looking on Twitter, uh, Rick Bozich tweeted that uh, Romeo Langford said that if Indiana goes to the NIT, he will play, which absolutely doesn't surprise Good. me at all. Look, I, you know, I, I don't know. We talked about this a lot. I get, I get so tired of the people talking about, you know, when Romeo has a bad performance or plays bad for a few minutes, you know, that he's cleaning out his locker and all this stuff. Like, look, folks, freshmen are going to be inconsistent. We forget about that with him because he's a five star you know, superstar type player that has been good, you know, in so many games. And we, I think, have properly criticized him in this game for not, you know, doing some of the things offensively that he needed to do. But if you're checked out of the game, you don't have six rebounds and five assists and, you know, play tough defense. I mean, you know, so I just, I I get so tired of that narrative. And so I don't say that that Rick Bozich tweeted that like it's a surprise by any means. I have felt like he has been invested in this team from day one. 
And everybody you know, who's around this team says that. Yes. So, you know, losses come up and people start spouting off this nonsense and it ticks me off. And I'm, I'm getting text messages because uh, parents of recruits that uh, that Indiana hopes will uh, choose Indiana on Friday are tweeting out, you know, negative things about fan reactions and saying some of the meanest things that they've ever seen said to players. Which is, again, I hate that we always have to come on here and say this. And probably the people that we're talking to aren't the ones that need to hear it. But people you know, pay attention to that stuff. They do. If you're going to be on social media, social do media it. It doesn't matter. Oh, God. Yeah. Be, do it respectfully. You know, critique the play, not the person, not the player. But anyway, uh, I digress. I don't want to get into any more of that stuff. I obviously concur. Uh, game ball to Devontae Green. This isn't even a close game without him. Honorable mention to Deron Davis and to Evan Fitzner. And I'm also going to give honorable mention to Al Durham. Uh, and I don't know if we talked about him quite enough today because I thought, again, in a game where toughness and a willingness to take contact was so important, I thought Al did that. You know, he was the one guy or one of the guys that was really willing to go in there and get hammered. And he's going to get calls at some point. And he does a good job of selling contact, but he's not getting those calls. You know, I almost wonder with Al... If the way that he kind of flails, if officials feel like he's trying to sell contact too much, and if he doesn't get the benefit of the doubt for that, I've wondered that. But hopefully as an upperclassman, that changes. The problem with Al's game today, Ryan, is he wasn't able to make his open shots. He is a guy that you want taking open threes. Yeah. He got good looks, missed all three of them. But to his credit, he didn't let that get him down. Some games, he has gone into a shell and just not been aggressive offensively. He didn't do that today. And he drove hard to the basket, You know, made all three of the free throws that he got, also had three boards and three assists. So I thought Al you know, brought it and played some pretty tough defense today. So if I'm going to hand out some, you know, an honorable mention game ball, um, you know, just because we've said everything there is to say about Devontae. I liked what I saw from Al, and I think that's the kind of game he needs to bring as he becomes an upperclassman now, is take the open shots when they're there, yeah. but drive. It's the best thing he does. He's so good at it, and as an upperclassman, both because of his own savvy and because of the respect that you tend to get when you get a little bit older in the league, he's going to start getting those calls because, my God, he got hammered to the ground, and he is a tough, tough yeah, kid. I mean, the fact that he bounced back. really tough. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, that you certainly hit the nail on the head with Al. I think that he needs to, um, to certainly, you know, attack more off the dribble, but he's a guy who, you know, tonight he misses his open shots. Sometimes those fall. Sometimes those don't, those were all good looks. And again, some nights you just don't have it from three and Indiana didn't have it tonight other than Devonte green. Uh, I think that's something that everybody needs to work on in the off season and get better at is making those open looks because if they do that, it's a different, not only is it a different game, it's a different team in general. And, yeah. and we saw, as we said, with, with the starters, uh, they went one of, five i don't know 16 from three or 15 from three or something God. like that and what yeah. and the one was romeo lankford's first one in the first quarter so they went oh of whatever after that uh that's just not a sustainable model in modern basketball it's one of 14 uh quick math is not my strong suit but one of 14 so oh of 13 the rest of the game after romeo lankford hit that first one that's that's just un not sustainable in modern basketball no no shooting you know, outside of Devontae, shooting really did Indiana in today because they got some looks, and at some point with the way Ohio State was defending, you were going to have to make some of those, and Indiana didn't, and they didn't. They weren't tough enough, you know, driving to the basket as well. So it just wasn't, wasn't enough for Indiana on this day. Well, I was really hoping that we could use this section to preview Indiana's upcoming opponent. Unfortunately, Indiana does not have an upcoming opponent right now. Uh, so we will just have itself. to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Probably so this, now this we'll be fighting against the fan base and itself for the next. So one. now, now we just wait and we will wait and see. So uh, Indiana will almost surely have more games this season, but we don't know when. But we'll of course be here for you on the post game show when they do. Uh, but anyway, you're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Remember that because you're an Assembly Call listener, you get 20% off of your entire order at Who's Your Proud and HomeFieldApparel.com. Uh, while the Big Ten tournament is going on. So use the promo code ACBIG10 when you go there at homefieldapparel.com and at hoosierproud.com uh, so that you can get all the officially licensed IU gear or our Assembly Call logo t-shirts if you want those as well. Again, 20% off. ACBIG10 is the promo code. All right, Ryan, there's going to be much, much more to say, but I think you and I are both a little exasperated, a little exhausted, a little disappointed all of those things, and I think we've pretty much said everything there is to say about this particular performance. Too much of it felt familiar uh, from what we saw in January and you know through the middle part of February. Uh, so let's close up and 
move on. Let's go to last call. Uh, your final thoughts on another Indiana loss? Yeah, it's just a missed opportunity for Indiana. I, I, you know, I'm not sitting here throwing things at the wall. I, I think that we saw some of what got Indiana into the hole. Uh, it was in earlier this year, and we saw some things that helped it dig out of that hole. The problem is we saw too much of the former, not enough of the latter. And I think this is a team that needs to regroup because certainly they will play again this year. I think almost certainly um, we can hold out hope for the NCAA tournament that the committee overlooks some pretty serious deficits and, uh, and, and throws them in there. But, you know, the NIT is also another opportunity for the young guys in this team to play in some tournament style games, to get more experience, to practice full time, to, you know, continue to work their way back guys like race thompson who only got two minutes today it's an opportunity for him to get some more playing time it's an opportunity for a senior like evan fitzner maybe to continue some positive play that he saw today and maybe wrap up his indiana career on a high note uh an opportunity to see juan morgan play again and romeo langford play again if you're a fan and you want to go do that i mean i urge you to do so those guys have given a lot to this program they deserve fans to be there even if it is the nit and it's a lesser tournament hey you know what it's still games with those guys. And if Indiana can make a run in the NIT tournament, get to New York, get to the final and win the dang thing. You want to talk about positive momentum. That's positive momentum for the next year. I know it's a lesser tournament, but it's positive momentum. And in some ways doing that is probably better than losing in the first round of the NCAA tournament, because at least you can build on some stuff you did. And it gives these guys more games to play together, more games for the younger guys to develop chemistry, more games for a guy like Deron Davis to be on the court and get some more minutes under his belt for this year. More games for a guy like Devontae Green to to sort of build on this performance today. Um, this is important, and, and it's all part of rebuilding a program and, and getting it on the right footing. I know this is not the result we wanted this year. You look at the injuries, you look at what this team went through, and you look at the poor play. Forget, forget the injuries and all that. You look at the poor play for the middle part of the season, and it's disappointing as heck. But you know what? This team is still Indiana. It's still the Hoosiers. It's still our team. We need to support it no matter what. You can pick out the things that were wrong about it, but these kids are Hoosiers, and they'll always be Hoosiers just like you and me, and uh, and we need to support them and pick them up. And so if they get into the NIT, they get a home game. I think the fan base should look at it and and say, hey, you know what? It's another chance to watch these guys play and show up and and show out and, and uh, show these guys, just like you did on senior night, how much you appreciate them. No doubt about it. You know, to that point, Ryan, I know you have to leave, so hop off whenever you need to. Um, you know, to that point, I hope everybody got a chance to listen to the Kent Benson interview on the Hoosier Hysterics podcast. It was really good, as all of the interviews that those guys have done is. But, you know, to the point that, that Ryan makes about the NIT, you know, Kent talked about how, you know, when he got to Indiana, the 73-74 season. And there's a lot about this story that won't be comparable. That team was 23-5. and five. They were 12-2 and two in the conference, tied for first in the Big Ten. But at that time, you know, conference champions made the NCAA tournament. Indiana did not go to the NCAA tournament that year. And they, you know, they had the chance to go to the CCAT tournament, and they did not want to go. And Kent basically said that the athletic director told them, no, you're going to go to the tournament. They didn't want to go. They were kind of, in a way, forced to go. But they said, you know what? If we're going to go, then we're going to go win the dang thing. And that's exactly what they did. And of course, you know, we know what happened after that. It was a springboard, uh, you know, to 36 and 0 in the Big Ten and and 63 and 1 over two seasons in a national championship. Again, totally different scenario. They had gone to the Final Four before. I get all the differences, but you know what I'm saying is, you know, just because you're disappointed that you don't get your first opportunity for a tournament. You know, it's still playing a basketball tournament and you still have a chance to go win and you still have a chance to, you know, etch something onto a banner or put a trophy in the case that can never be taken away. And as proud as we are of the Indiana basketball program and the tradition and the heritage and as much as we believe that getting back to the NCAA tournament is what this program <laughs> needs to be able to count on and that needs to be the standard and it does. And even an NIT championship is still overall at the end of the season, when you look back on it, going to be disappointed because we know that this team had the potential to be more than that. It's still certainly better than the alternative, and it is something. And it is something that can build momentum for the rest of Archie Miller's tenure at Indiana. And for a lot of young guys who you know need to learn how to win games like that, need to learn how in, in a tournament situation, when you're playing against older guys who are bigger and more physical, you know, and when you're not at home, when you're on a neutral court, that it requires maybe a different level of focus and a different level of toughness. And today, I think we saw a team that is still struggling to learn some of those lessons. 
And the way that you learn it is you play together and you play in tournament settings and you go give it your all. And so uh, I think at this point, it's fair to assume, you know, I did see, you know, Galen Clavio tweet out that, uh, you know, it's still probably a 50-50 proposition for Indiana making the NCAA tournament, given their resume and depending on what else happens in the bubble. I don't know how much of a consensus opinion that is. He might be a little bit higher on Indiana than others. But, you know, while we wait for that, it certainly seems like at least this team would make the NIT. And I agree with Ryan. And I agree with the sentiment, you know, that that Kent Benson expressed, which is you may not want to go to it. Maybe you have to be forced to go to it. But if you're going to go, by God, go win the thing. And I hope that's the attitude that Indiana takes. I hope that's the attitude that the fans take. And I do just want to, you know, call back to something. Um, and, And also, again, I forgot to make this point. You know, we want to get back to the NCAA tournament. But we also need to have, I think, some humility as a fan base that we haven't been there in two years. We may not go for a third year. Let's take a tournament and use it as a stepping stone. And let's, you know, never lower the standards, but let's appreciate the steps sometimes and the patience that you may have to have to get back to where we want to go. And time will tell if this current coach and this current program is the one that's going to get us there. But an NIT would be a at least from where we stand right now, a positive step in that direction. Not one that we wanted to have to take, but one that we should take, obviously, if the situation is uh, afforded us. And I know, you know, what I said earlier about the fans, it, it started a conversation in the chat. I don't mean to suggest that Indiana's fan base is unique in having issues like this, but Indiana's fan base is the one that I pay attention to and the one that I see. And so when I make comments about being frustrated by some of the things that you see from fans, I fully understand that it's a very small minority. The problem is that social media amplifies the small minority. And it's incumbent upon every single person who gets on there, as we all know, to treat that responsibility seriously. And I think to, you know, try to tell each other when we see us, you know, when we see each other stepping out of line on it. So, you know, I, I, I certainly think that other fan bases have very much the same issues that Indiana's fan base does. I don't mean to imply that, that we're the only one. I certainly don't mean to imply that I never fall into the trap myself because I say things sometimes that I want to take back too. But I think it's something where we can all look after each other and try to be better and try to set more positive examples for each other and how we conduct ourselves and how we talk about the team publicly because people are paying attention. And it is always a good reminder to realize that fans have an impact probably more now than in the past with coloring the perception of what your program looks like to potential recruits and to others. And so let's take that responsibility seriously. Let's lead by example and, you know, try to be solutions to that problem. And I think most of the people listening to this show are, um, you know, but anyway, I, so I don't want to get on too much about that, but just, uh, just a frustrating day, a really frustrating day. This is disappointing. I really thought today was going to be different in the big 10 tournament, I thought this team was rolling. I thought the team that we saw over the last four games was a team that we would see today. Uh, you know, And I credit Ohio State for a lot of it. Again, I thought they came and just played tougher. I didn't think they played well, like Ryan said, but I thought they had a better game plan. I thought they executed it better, and they got to the 50-50 balls. And ultimately, this game ended up being close like a lot of people thought. It wasn't the journey people thought the game would take to get there by any means. But in games like this, those things are going to matter. They're going to make a difference. And at the end, they did make a difference because it was a four-point game. And if you just have two of those bad passes back, it's different. If you get a couple of those loose balls, the game is different. It's a tough lesson to learn. I hope, especially the young guys who are going to be around for the future of Indiana basketball, I hope they learn that lesson from this game. you got to take care of those little things in a game like this when the margins are so small to win the game. And too often this season, Indiana didn't do it. Uh, And it took Indiana too long to play with the kind of desperation that they needed. And that's why this game was such a microcosm of the season in a lot of ways. But thank you all for being here, uh, obviously. And as soon as we find out when Indiana will be playing again, we will talk about it and uh, and have a post-game show for whenever that is. And we'll still keep doing our regular content uh, because the season is still on. The season is not over yet. So... We will, uh, we will keep doing that as long as there are still games to be played. All right, that'll do it for us on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assemblycall. You can also subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Thank you for listening. We'll be back to talk with you again at a minimum on Monday for Banner Monday. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosiers.
Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. Man. Disappointing. Disappointing. Um, anyway, thanks, everybody, for being here. I appreciate that. Um, great, great to see you guys all in the chat. And, uh, yeah, not much else to say. So I will uh, go get this podcast up and talk to you guys all later.